And now, it's Lunchtime with Ira, live from the Las Vegas Hilton. Our next guest is Elvis Friend and bodyguard Sonny West. He's author of the new book, Elvis Still Taking Care of Business. Sonny was Elvis's close friend, uh, trusted confidant and bodyguard. He, uh, for 16 years, as a matter of fact, and uh, although you're semi-retired, right, Sonny? Yes. Uh, he occasionally performs an hour-long uh, show around the world called Elvis uh, Close Up and Personal or up close and personal, right? Uh, and uh, you reside in Tennessee. Right, yes, right outside of Nashville, Hendersonville. Is and that close to Johnny Cash's? Uh, yes, it was. Matter of fact, that, you know, it just the yeah, yeah. That, there's a there's a lot of stories about that whole little area there. Roy Orbison's home was next door, and it burned down. He lost two children back in the '80s, so. Maybe you ought to move to Southern Nevada. Well, I'm okay. I'm not in that area. All right. <laughs> now this is. Uh, I'm going to show the the book here, which is. Uh, your second book on Elvis. Yes, sir. And the first book was, uh, I guess people had said that it was a little harsh on Elvis and you decided to write a second book. What, what was the decision to write a, a second book on Elvis? Well, I couldn't let Elvis, Elvis what happened was written as a challenge to him to try to show him where he was headed because we saw it happening the last couple of years and we started approaching him about it and it irritated him, told us to stay out of it, it's none of our business. And if we didn't stay out of it, we'd look, be looking for other jobs. and. It was more important for us to do Red and I, especially, to do what we needed to do to help this man that we love so much. There was and a discussion, though, about, um, and I have talked to both uh, Jerry Schilling and also Lorena um, uh, as well, uh, the Colonel's uh, wife. Uh, Luann, uh, I love uh, her. Luann, excuse yes, me, yes. yes. And um, both of them talked about the, the dynamics between Elvis and the colonel and everybody thought that uh, the colonel ran everything but Elvis was pretty strong will let me tell you something Colonel Parker did what Elvis wanted and the colonel <clears throat> has taken more he's the most maligned man I've ever seen because I was with him I went with him in the advance team I set the security up with him he taught me everything about security on the road so I spent a lot of time with him I was a day ahead of Elvis uh, getting everything set up for him to come in and I got to know this man very well and the thing with Barbara Streisand, that, that wasn't true. See, Jerry was in on the meeting, Jerry Schilling with Joe Esposito and John Peters and Barbara in that section of the dressing room while the rest of us were out there. But Jerry wasn't working for Elvis at the time. So the next day after Elvis had told Barbara, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd really like to do this. To do what though? Uh, uh, a star is born. Okay. Yeah. So Jerry left. Well, if he hadn't, he would have known because he knew Elvis well enough too that when Elvis started picking at something, something's bubbling there, something's going to happen. And he started trying to make little comments about working with Barbara and about her hairdresser boyfriend. And Red and I looked at each other and said, he's not, because we were so excited he was going to do it. We thought this might start him back and, and, and let him have a break from just touring, touring, touring. And uh, we knew that he wasn't going to do it. And he just told Colonel, get him out of it. So Barbara said that Elvis said he's going to do it. And then, of course, when the Colonel went for the deal, she blamed the Colonel. The Colonel wanted too much. Colonel didn't want too much. He wanted what Elvis wanted him to do. And that's just the way it was. He, everyone blames him. And he always kept his mouth shut. He never said, hey, that was Elvis' decision. He just took the heat, you know? So. The, the challenge for Elvis is that he's larger than life or was larger than life he's obviously larger than life even now selling he started at the hill uh, well it was the international then in 1969 right. performed a lot of shows and it was over a period of um over a period of time where he would work two shows a night mm -hmm. and that's almost unheard of today in most of the entertainment right venues. yeah he did two shows a night for i think the first three years and uh I know once or twice we did a, a, a special show for the people on the strip to come to like at 2 o'clock in the morning so they could come see him and everything. But uh, it, it really did wear him out and uh, we did it twice a year. But the rest of the time he would go out on tour for two or three weeks, be off for two or three weeks, so it, it worked okay. But he just, uh, Elvis just kind of got a little bit apathetic. He, he just kind of got in a groove there with the singing. He loved performing, but in between he got where he didn't care that much. We used to play football, work out karate, and these things just kind of slipped away. And that last year, once when Red and I were gone, 
there was no old school left. There was no one there that he could sit there. They were all younger guys or new guys that didn't go back to the 50s and the 60s. Uh, Joe did, and Jerry and them did, but they lived in California. After right. the tour, they're gone. There's no one in Memphis. And how did they, they come up with that term, the Memphis Mafia? I'm not sure. I do know that we, I know why, because we pull up in a couple of limousines, black limousines, going into the the shows here and we'd get out with our black suits and ties, mohair suits and the, the dark glasses and someone said, who is that, the Mafia? And someone said, yeah, the Memphis Mafia. And I don't know if that got to a columnist or something. I feel, and I could be wrong, that James Bacon, the columnist, the columnist in mm-hmm. L.A. who was very close with Sinatra, and I think he James gave Bacon. them, I think he gave them the Rat Pack. I think he coined that phrase, and he may have done this because he liked to, as you know, columnists like to come up with something like that. So I can't give it to him, but I think it might have been him. Now, the title of your book is Still Taking Care of Business, and you have photos in your book as well as, as obviously right, a narrative. Right. How did you decide on the, that title? Is it, does it imply, uh, as, at least I got that inference, that um, even with him being gone, he's bigger than ever? I mean, you have uh, the songs... Uh, are selling and uh, there was merchandising and he just seems to the revenue for post Elvis is higher than it was while Elvis was alive. It's a combination of that because he is, you know, uh, he's huge icon. He worldwide, he's just huge. Uh, missionaries talk about they go into the deepest part of the jungles in in those little hut mud huts and stuff. And many, many of them have a picture of Elvis on the wall and it's the only picture they got in there. So they come back and say that. But anyway, and the other thing is I want him to know that I am still taking care of business Elvis. I'm still taking care. I want to do what I can to keep your legacy going and let fans know what a fascinating, wonderful guy you were. And that I, I go out and speak to schools. I used to go to high schools, junior. Now I'm down to middle school talking about addictive natures. Be careful. You don't know. You're too young. None of them can tell me in the grade schools what addictive means. And I said, that's because you're too young. Could I ask many of you know if that means is, what it means? Is it related, though? Uh, addiction is not necessarily related to talent. In other words, you can be an addictive personality without having the talent oh, that exactly. Elvis had. Yes. So he had a combination of, of, of things going on. He had, obviously, the talent. He had the oh. iconic stature uh, for decades. Uh, and that has to have a, an impact on your mentality, too. It's not as if you were a, a big name for a year or two, and then that's it. You're a big name for decades. Uh, I think of people like Sinatra that was on the top for several decades oh, yes, and that, that's yes. got to have an impact on your psyche uh, in some way as a human being because it does it does and it did with him but at one thing about it he was happy being Elvis Presley he wasn't the lonely oh I'm it's up here at the top he said many times hey this is not a point up at the top that's not a point it's a big flat area and anyone that works hard and got talent can get right up there so he said while I'm there I'm going to enjoy it who knows when I might start down I also performed with Liberace uh, here initially he Correct. learned a lot. Yes, he did. And he learned a lot from Liberace. Liberace was the one that told him, and it may have been an influence in Elvis later. He said, you know, what you need to do, because Elvis told him about the outfits. Man, they're beautiful. And he says, well, I always think that if something happens to me that I, my voice fails or my, pan, my hands go numb, I can always do a fashion show. Yeah. And so <laughs> Elvis, as you saw his outfits, he set the tone. He set the tone. Right. Did he teach uh, Liberace karate? No, he no, hadn't got into karate at that yeah. time. That was in 56 when he was here, when he met with uh, Liberace the first time, and they talked about that. Uh, Elvis started uh, karate in Germany in 1958 when he went over there. He started and studied it and got his first belt, black belt in 1960, about a year afterwards. Did he study it throughout his life, karate? Yes, he did. He studied it for, I worked out with him. Uh, See, that's the thing that I think people get confused about is that on the one hand, if you, he was dedicated to karate, which is a, a mental and physical discipline. It's a martial art. Right. It's not just something that you do. And yet at the same time, he was obviously addicted to uh, substances. So how do you reconcile those two things? Well, I don't know if I can. I just know that it's a reality, and I know that there's other people. Why do doctors become addicts when they know what medicine does? And well, yet because they become... it, it's free. Exactly. If you're a doctor. Well, it was almost free to Elvis. Well, he did give out Cadillacs here and there for <laughs> doctors. <laughs> was he? Uh, I, I always uh, had heard from people and read that he's a very generous man in the sense that he would just he would go and give someone a car or 
he, I'm going to tell you, Ira, his joy was giving. And he didn't want you to fawn all over him after it and keep going. After he gave it to you, got that initial reaction, saw your eyes light up, saw him. That was it for him. You hugged him and that, don't come at me again tomorrow and say, oh, I still can't believe what you did yesterday. Leave it alone. I got other things to do for other people. He was just very giving. He got that from his mother. His mother was a very giving woman. And she, Elvis used to come downstairs there at Graceland and he'd walk into the breakfast area and there's his mom with several women that she has brought home from the supermarket that wants to meet him. And he said, there, honey, these women want to say hi to you. This is, y'all give him his names. And Elvis say his name, then he'd go back. He said, well, I got to go back up and clean up. But that's just the way she was. She just opened it up to people. She's just wonderful. Did person. he ever decide to buy the supermarket? And that way he could no, just uh, he, uh, control it there. <laughs> he wanted a drugstore. He did own a drugstore? No, he wanted oh, one. Oh, he wanted to own a drugstore, yeah. No, that, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But I mean, too. that's true. He was, sure. he was really thinking about buying one. Do you go to Graceland at all? I went up there in 1983 with with a guy that played with the group Alabama, Jeff. Teddy and his two cousins had gone to Bear Bryant's last football game at the Liberty Bowl and while in Memphis they went to Graceland. They came home telling him about it. So I'm working on tour with them and he says you got to take me. So I called Jack Soden, the CEO there and he met us and we took Jeff through but we went through with a regular tour, no specially. And I said, I'll meet you. He, when they went to go to the gravesite, I said, I'll, I'll meet you back at the racquetball court. So I went around. Uh, and I went back up there in 96 at the, when they were having the candlelight service. And I got up there, and as I, there were like six people deep. And as I went in, and I knew approximately where Elvis' the gravesite was, and I stopped and I turned, and it was like there's just an opening there, and I could see him. And I said, I got to get out of here. And I turned to leave. And, and the guys came with me, and I was crying. I, it, I wasn't there when he uh, passed away. I was in California. And because of the book, I, mean, I felt it wise not to go back there. But, uh, but when I you had did, my memories. did you get that vibe when you just got, went to Graceland itself as opposed to standing where the graveside Ooh. was? I, I got it. Yeah, that. that's why I haven't been back since then. And you got to remember something, too, Ira. The last time I spoke to him or saw him alive was in the foyer of Graceland after we did our tour on July the 5th, 1976 at the Mid-South Coliseum. It was the end of the tour. He was walking up those steps and he wished me happy birthday because it was my birthday, July 5th. And he was going up and I said, well, I'll see you in a few days, boss, get some rest and everything. And that was it. And I had no idea that eight days later his father was going to give us from Elvis's. That's one thing I'd like to make clear. Vernon Presley did not fire us. He didn't have the authority over the guys. Elvis did. And so Elvis told him to let us go and he's going to hire me and Ritt back in two or three months, give him enough money to live on for two or three months, but I got to show him I'm still the boss. And he was, and your book uh, points that out. Thanks yeah. so much for being yeah, on the thank show. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was Sonny West, ladies and gentlemen. He's author of the new book, Elvis, Still Taking Care of Business, available everywhere. We'll be right back.